So here is the order of operations. Let's make a new, I wrote this yesterday, but apparently, so it's on my computer at home, I didn't save it. Uh, you guys can't see this because it's very tiny. Um, so the first thing that happened in our kind of prehistory is the Duke of House Valletta dies. House Valletta They had power because they kind of controlled the money. They collected taxes. Le What's her name? Do we know her name? Duchess Lenora, right? Spelled it in the Welsh spelling there for a second. Uh, um, so desperate this woman enacts what's called the ritual of desecration in order to attempt to try to raise her husband um, from the dead. It fails, which the mysterious, like, why it should not have failed. And instead, uh, over 3,000 people uh, died. Right, so uh, this, was a, this was a catastrophe. Right, uh, and she did it. This is not. This is not a. Um, what's what I'm looking for? The, this. This like she is the dead lady, and she rules over a dead city. Right. These people. Now she knew what she was doing, and she did her best to get everybody out of the district. You know, did it in the middle of the night. This is a place where people work mostly, not live. So there weren't that many people in this district when it happened, and she did her best to try to. I, I think that she. She made it look like there was an outbreak of like cholera or typhus or something like that on purpose to get people out of the city. The city, when I say the city, I mean the district that House Valletta controls. But each of these are like their own city. They even have different architectural styles. Uh, but there were still 3,000 people there who all died. And they were raised as undead. And so now the dead lady rules over a dead city. And the problem is, if not like, you know, when you kill 3,000 people, your, your, you know, one of the world's greatest criminals. And there are a lot of people in the city who there are, you know, the families and friends of 3,000 people who would like to see her die. They would like to see her brought to justice. But she's like, she's a vampire lord. And she controls an army of death knights and stuff now because of this ritual. So they, they, can't, they can't bring her to justice. So she is, uh, you know, by most definitions, evil. But now she's in charge, right? She's in charge of the house. So um, House Valletta are the tax collectors. She's still doing her husband's job, right? Um, every time anyone else tries to take over, they end up with a fistful of death knight. And so her revenue men continue to collect the taxes. And, you know, the city's millions of people. There are a whole bunch of people who live in the city that don't care about what happened over on the east side that thing. They heard about it. They read about it. It's a tragedy. But they don't know anybody who was involved. And they're just happy that everything's still ticking along nicely. So she is still she is still collecting the taxes and basically waiting for her. And that, what, that's the thing is she's like, my husband will return. And when he does, the taxes collected will be dispersed, you know, as is normal. But until then, she's going to sit on them. So she controls a lot of the money. Well, then the prince died. Okay, so something else happened. So, so because she's collecting the taxes... Something happens. Uh, the city needs money. Lady, we need the money. And she's like, well, my husband will return, and when he does, is her refrain. Um, maybe she's hoping that since she couldn't figure out how to bring him back, all these powerful noble houses that want their taxes, they will figure out a way to bring him back since that's her condition. Make sense? Uh, so she's, you know, got tons of cash. So the prince does something crazy. The prince is still alive at this point. The prince, desperate for revenue, admits three guilds into the nobility. So how did we end up with three guilds on the prince's council, which we'll have to come up with a name for. But the governing body of the city 
How did we end up with three guilds suddenly now made the legal equals of the noble houses? We needed the cash. We needed the money. Right? And so these three guilds buy in. And now what had been kind of, everybody knew that these guilds had a lot of power because they didn't just control money, they controlled things like trade and stuff like that. So now we've got these three guilds, the Fulcrum and two other guilds, I don't know which yet, um, that are now legally n noble houses. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they may like, they, the, the, the city still needs money. So the nobles are like, if we don't do something, we're gonna have to, so anyway, then the prince dies. And that's kind of where, the, where we start. These are the major events uh, that have happened recently. And they set up where we are and how we got here, right? That's important. This is, uh, we're gonna, you know, somebody, a lot of people watch the, um, vi the video on demand, the VOD, as the kids call it, on the YouTubes, had a di very different reaction than the people watching it live. The people watching the video on demand were like, I, I'm really um, upset at how black and white the morality in the city is. There are the guilds who are good and the noble houses who are evil. Um, and I'm like, uh, yeah, correct. Um, that being said, the, 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 the guilds are the good guys and the noble houses are the bad guys. Look, right? that's, that's like, people don't complain that they wish the emperor in Star Wars was more relatable. Um, or yeah, I mean, some people do and they, they watch The Last Jedi. Um, but it's going to get more nuanced than that. Each of these, each of these heads of these houses, there may be one noble house head who is just literally a, a mustache twirling villain, because it's always good to have one of those. But the other heads of the noble houses all have different responsibilities, and they take those responsibilities seriously, right? So even though they hate the rise of the guilds, they hate having to go into the prince's privy council and debate what to do because they have to reach consensus. They run the city now that the prince is dead and talk to women, right? And they hate that. They hate it. But they take their responsibilities seriously. They take the city seriously. They take the people the people who live under them, that live in their districts seriously. They want to protect them. They want those people to be prosperous. These are not contradictory, right? So they are, on, on the one hand, they are old school traditionalist and nationalist. But on the other hand, they are. They will fight and die to protect. Uh, to protect capital. So it's not as simple as good versus evil. A lot of the guilds that you're going to meet, the heads of these guilds, um, will do awful and terrible things in order to hang on to the power that they've got. Questionable things, things that if you like, you like that person when you met them until you found out what they did, and now you're like, wait, what? Um, so there's the surface level, right? There's a surface level where you first show up to capital and you find out what's going on. And you're like, oh, I like the guilds. The guilds are dope. Yeah. But then you find out actually the heads of these guilds are awful. They're in, in, in many ways, they are awful people and have done terrible things. Then you meet some of the heads of the noble houses and you're like, okay, I don't like this person, but, but this person has sacrificed a lot in order to keep the city running and will continue to do so. These seven lords of capital are the ones that run the city. They have to get together and decide what to do. They were part of the prince's privy council, but the prince is dead. They still continue doing their thing. There are other incredibly powerful people in the city. They're just not part of this council. Right? This council has a lot more power than they used to because the prince is dead. The problem is three of them are uh, three of them are guilds, and they tend not to vote with the other three. And then one of them is undead and doesn't seem to. She passes all the time. The relationship between the guilds who bought in and the ones that didn't is they're the ones that have the most money. Uh, and it may be that the fulcrum might have loaned some of these guilds that maybe didn't have enough money, but the fulcrum was like, we want, we want more power in the council. We want it. It's kind of the difference between being a programmer and a designer. So, um, the guilds were all programmers. We're really important. We're the grease that runs this city. All the money comes through us. You need us. But the designers are the ones who decide what the game is going to be about, and it annoys us that we basically have to do that. We have to. We are basically in charge of implementing their ideas. Ugh, I hate that. Ugh. If I were a designer, then it would be me who was deciding the direction the game was going. So they wanted to be designers, so they paid to get in, and now they help. Now they're actually making legal decisions about, you know, the how the city is run. So who are the other guilds? Well, uh, there's two more. We only have to come up with two more factions, and we're done for today. The guilds that aren't nobility are like. <gasps> It can be done. 
They did it. They cracked it. They cracked the, they made it in. We've been subject to, we have a lot of money, but we've been subject to laws and taxation and all this bullshit. We have to pay in-size taxes and excise taxes. And we have to have you know, all this crap in order to run our businesses. And we don't, And but these three made it in. We could make it in. Uh, what can we do to help these guys? So I think that the next guild that is a noble house are the, uh, these guys are, are very new. And they were probably, Um, they were probably loaned to the money by the fulcrum. These guys are, these guys control the information. These guys are relatively new and they have supplanted uh, the engravers who were previously the folks in charge of, um, you know, news, quote unquote, very slow, only rich people could afford it. Now these guys are printing newspapers, not their, their broadsheets, and what they say, people believe. People go out in the morning or in the evening and they spend a couple of copper or spend, a, you know, and they and they read what the what these people, who are these people? Why do they get to say? The nobles hate these guys. Like, I don't understand. I'm I'm the Duke, I'm, I'm, I'm Duke Orsino. What I say should matter. Yeah, but that's, you didn't, you weren't quoted in the paper and everyone in capital read this. So suddenly they've got a Walter Cronkite, right? Oh, don't listen to that guy, the president says. Don't listen to him, who's he? Shit. We lost Walter Cronkite. Now no one listens to us, right? So the Broadsheet Guild are super powerful, uh, but they're also really, really new. So this person is either from Corsair or from um, Vasloria. I think Corsair. Nobility, that is not how you spell nobility, by the way. That is not English. Nobility. I'll show you some nobility. So Corsair is basically uh, pre-Islamic Arabia. So her name, I think, is Inan. Uh, and probably she has a, uh, a bint in there somewhere. Been to an owl. I think an owl. I think she's from a noble family. She's from a noble family in Corsair. So what I did was I needed a authentic uh, but obscure, ideally, um, ancient female Arab name, right? And uh, so what I did was I went and looked up. This is how I. This is how I come up with names. This is uh, you know some people will like this, some people won't. But I, I, am a, I am philosophically opposed to uh, fantasy names that just sound like a bunch of random syllables people slammed together uh, because I don't think that's how language works. <laughs> um, I think it's actually incredibly difficult to make up, um, make up completely from whole cloth words that sound like they would be real words. Uh, but that being said, I'm not 100% on this. We could, uh, we, could, we, could, we could swap her out and do something else. Um, Explicit Agadophilus is Latin, or Latinish. It's Cod Latin. But Explicit Agadophilus sounds like a real, real word. So the, obviously there are other um, fantasy worlds that quite explicitly just use random collections of syllables for the names of people and places. And to me, they sound absurd. Um, but that being said, some people go to fantasy because what they want is they want a world that bears no resemblance to the one they live in. I get that. That's just not me. She is a noble, a minor noble. Um, she's like, uh, you know, the sixth daughter or something like that. So she came here because she's like, I'm, I have no prospects back home. Uh, with that said in mind, where do you draw inspiration for your dragonborn names? I make those up. <laughs> I have a kind of a logic to it. I, there's certain syllables that they assemble. So I don't just fart out a name. I sit there and I go over the different syllables and I think I know what some of the different syllables mean. 
I don't obey. I don't obey rules for the sake of obeying rules. That's uh, consistency is the hobgoblin of a tiny mind. Uh, daughter of minor nobility and corsair, and she's kind of she uh, basically like uh, she basically invented this thing. Uh, and but there there was I, I I will probably figure out exactly what she invented because there were printing presses before her they just didn't work really well they couldn't be relied on they broke down too often and she there was some breakthrough she had that made it so they were super super reliable it might be something like the paper actually uh, brother of Anubis uh, it might have been something about the, the quality of the paper that might be like she may have come up with a way to make really really um, really you know cheap thing so she invented this thing and uh but she's probably not like the editor she's not the person who decides what goes in the paper and she is now uh riohan no. she was born in corsair So we know a little bit about her. Yes, the old nobility are deeply anti-immigrant. Absolutely, 100%. Um, actually, I wouldn't say that's true. Because the capital is, it's, you know, it's the most multicultural city in the world. Um, they, they know, they're not anti-immigrant. This is a complex, this is a complex situation. They're not anti-immigrant. They need, they need the, the reason the reason they have power is because everybody comes to capital. Uh, they just don't want those people to have any power. It's one thing to be they're, they're happy. In fact, each of these noble houses have uh, in their districts they have lots of people who come from there. They are it's it, they have people who live people from all over the world, people from all these different heritages who have moved to capital. Some of them have been some of these people are they don't look Rioan. Some of them are they look Vaslorian. They look like white guys. But they've been living, their, their family has been in capital for several generations. Uh, and they are, and the, the noble houses want to protect them. We have a responsibility. These are our, these are our peasants, basically. They don't, they don't use that language. Um, so they want, they have, a, they have a real sense of their noble duty to the citizens of capital. And those citizens come in every shape and size. They just don't think those people should have any power, right? It's like Napoleon. Napoleon, Napoleon believed very strongly in personal liberty and justice, but he didn't believe in upward mobility. He's like, what? No, every, every, every man in his place and a place for every man. We tend to conflate those things, but not every culture has. So it's not exactly this black and white anti-immigrant. Like they very much want to protect and also, you know, raise the standard of living of all of the people who are under, their, who live in their district. They just don't think those people should have any power. It's an affront to them. It's an affront to their traditions. And a lot of those people feel the same way. A lot of those people feel like the proper nobleman, there's a, they have a look that's brown skin, dark black hair, big mustache, male. That's a nobleman. Mm, that's a nobleman, right? And we have those same biases. Like when somebody comes on the, when somebody, when you hear the, the airline pilot punch in, there's a certain voice you want to hear in your head. Right? There's, we have those same biases, so they're, it's not completely black and white. So these guys are, so even the most kind of evil, manipulative, um, anti-guild, uh, anti-anyone who's not Riohan nobleman, who we've met so far, even that guy doesn't think that capital should be all Riohan. Or, uh, and even what that means differs, right? Um, somebody like Inan 
is exactly what he fucking hates. This person wasn't born here. This person doesn't care about our traditions. It probably speaks common. I haven't figured out how languages work in my setting yet because the way it works in D&D annoys me. But she doesn't speak Riohan. She probably doesn't even speak it at all, right? She speaks whatever language, of course, she speaks uh, Hazar. And she probably has to have like a fucking translator if she wants to talk to the, to the nobles. But she is super programmer. She's a programmer, right? Not a people person. So she needs a people person, and that's her editor. And her editor is the muscle. The editor is the face, the face man. So what the, uh, who is this, who is this guy? An ogre? That's not bad. Hobgoblin? Uh, I don't know. A fire ganasi? That's interesting. A fire ganasi? Um, I don't actually know what a ganasi is. A goliath? People like a drow. Oh, an, an astral celestial. A drow. I like that. I like that. I like a drow, like a drow bard. I don't like Ganassi because I would have to explain what that is to all my players. <laughs> and that's that's how you know it's not a good idea. Um, well, people like, let's, let's hang on a minute. People like, um, I like drow. I like Ganassi. Ganassi is kind of in the... Uh, somebody else said something I liked. It wasn't... Oh, Dragonborn? Ooh! A gemstone Dragonborn. That's actually a pretty cool idea. So, hang on one second. Nobody go anywhere. Uh, an Onyx. Onyx Dragonborn would be nice because we haven't seen them in... Um, we haven't seen them in what do you call it. So, her editor is a gemstone Dragonborn. Gemstone Dragonborn tend to be... Um, they're, they're high intelligence. They have plus two to int and plus one to charisma, I believe. Uh, yeah, plus two int, plus one charisma. So this guy could be a bard. Are gemstone dragonborns psychic? Yes, they have silence. Yeah, uh, they have two. They have a bunch of abilities, and people in the in the when they saw the book, they were like, "These abilities are too good." They have one of the abilities they have is uh, flay which is a bonus action. It's basically, imagine a breath weapon. Imagine if a dragon's breath weapon was a bonus action. However, the, and so you're like, this is too good. And I'm like, well, you may think that, and you may be right. We can all we can change it ultimately, but they use charges. They use the psionic charges based on their crystals. And I wanted to make sure that there was an option that would allow the, that would encourage the DM running the gemstone dragons to burn their charges early. Right? So yeah, it's a boat, you go like that. And now suddenly managing charges, managing your psionic charges, because there's a recharge every every round or something, or I don't know how often you do it, you roll a really tiny die and recharge some of your stuff. So the goal is to get whoever is running this dragon to a point where this die is important. And that means we got to be able to dump charges early and quick and kind of go supernova. That's why Amplify is so good. Amplify wreathes the dragon's physical attacks with psionic energy, right? And when they attack, they do a shitload more damage. Um, and that's because I want the dragons to get, you know, I want to encourage people running these dragons to get into melee. Oh, it's so good. This power is so good. Yeah, but to use it, you physically have to get next to your, your enemies, the heroes, the PCs. And that means, wham, they're going to do a shitload of damage. So there's, there's method to my madness. That's not the same thing as saying it's good design. I'm not going to lie to you. It could be bad design. However, so the gemstone dragonborn, uh, I don't mind it being onyx. Because we'll learn something about the Onyx uh, gemstones. Um, John of Phoenix says they should be a bard. Onyx gemstone dragonborn bard. Of course, he's the editor. Of course, he's a bard. Can we come back to the dragonborn and please not make him a bard? He's going to be a double bard now. He's double class. He's dual class. Bard, bard. Done. I think the guy has to be a bard because he's the head. He's the editor. Right, he's the he's he's the um, he's the guy who writes the stuff. He's the face man. He talks to the people. He's the person that that Enon uh, sends to the privy meetings. So, um, what's this guy's name? I'm thinking of a name. These are just gonna be a bunch of nonsense syllables I throw out. Uh, like Korovaxinar is the name of the eldest sapphire dragon. Orvo Sortiax is the ruby dragon. Irdazavanax. Sorty axe, dra so let's see, we'll stay away from the AX. Um, I 
Uh, the Dragonborn are, uh, they don't really have a gender. Uh, they can be either male or female in order to, they can kind of switch. It's not, they don't, they don't get to choose. It's under evolutionary pressures. Um, it has to do with hormones and stuff like that. So if there are too many or not enough of one or the other, then it's like, they're like frogs. Um, and that has something to do with their quasi-biological nature. Um, so I think Halasar for now, I may change that. No, they're purely business partners. Um, like this guy and they want to give him the straight dope how is she not attracted to him if he's so charming i think that uh i don't think that she is really into sex i think that she's like she's she's you know i would not describe enon as being like a sexual being she is she is somebody who's who just wants to make the press better She's one of those people that like doesn't isn't great with reading facial expressions and something like that. It's almost like you know who it's like. You ready for this? It's like um, the it's like uh, Jamie and Adam from MythBusters, right? Like one of these is the garrulous, outgoing, talking one in there, and they make a great team, right? But they're not like friends outside of work. But the the pre the broadsheet guild doesn't work without them. The chat is dangerously close to shipping these two characters. Um, you know, I'm sure Halasar would be happy if people thought that, but they are literally like, like Inan goes home, she, she works, you know, like, you know, 14 hours a day, goes home, sleeps, come back, and she just wants to tinker. Um, she just wants to improve this. She has a mind of wheels and gears and stuff like that, and she tends to attract, you know, a lot of dwarves work for her. She tends to attract people that are like, we just want to make the press better. She doesn't even really understand how she is changing the world. He does. Halasar does. He's like, Halasar, yeah. Boom. Like, like, he does not understand what she does. She's like a magician, from his point of view. And she has no idea what this guy is talking about. She doesn't read the broadsheet that she makes. She doesn't read it. Right? She's not aware of the impact it's having on the city. Yeah, Halasar is the guy who goes to the meetings. He doesn't have any actual real power. He's not a nobleman. It's Inan who was a nobleman. Um, so we know a little bit about the broadsheet guild. These guys have a lot of power. Uh, and it's growing by the day. And there's a lot, there's a, we know a little bit about the relationship between the people. So the, the heroes, so for instance, let's think about this from the player's point of view. How do the players find out this place exists? You, you, you already know the answer, by the way. Um, how do you guys, how do the players find out that the Broadsheet Guild even exists? They get a paper. <laughs> exactly. They're going to show up. Exactly. They're going to show up in capital and there's going to be people handing out and probably i'll have to print one i'll probably have to write one and make it up and the players and they're gonna be like what the hell is this and they're not even gonna it's, it's not even gonna occur to them i'm doing a good job it's not even going to occur to them that this was written by somebody and published by somebody and those people have a lot of power instead they're gonna be focused on what is being written they're gonna be like oh here there's the you know and maybe they're hammered up with the, or whatever yeah they're gonna read a broadsheet they're gonna read a broadsheet and they're gonna think about the things in the broadsheet way before they realize the guys who print this have it. They must have a shitload of power, right? Uh, and there's probably more than one there. Right? So somebody said, "Is is Halasar exploiting Inan? He thought he was. He thought he was scamming his way into power. Failed playwright. But this girl, she doesn't know what she's got. She doesn't understand what can be done, right? Like the first couple of these things were had like recipes and shit in them. She doesn't understand. 
So he thought he was scamming his way in and she's like, I actually don't care. You, you think you're scamming me, but you're not because I genuinely do not give a shit about the order in which the words, the letters go in. What could be less interesting? She's purely interested in the technological challenge of the, uh, and he came to understand that. And now they realize they're the perfect partnership. Now they really need each other, right? Because he is the person that makes, he, the, the only reason the she has a job is because of how much money this thing makes. And that she can afford to do things now she never could before. And so they are this perfect symbiotic relationship. I, neither, either one of them would be useless, right? Her without him, there'd be no paper. There was a broadsheet that she and her team made, and it was incredibly banal, and no one bought it. And then he read one of these, and he was like, am I the only one who gets it? And he was. And the fact that he used to be a playwright, no one else could edit this stuff. No one else could, he knows if it, if it bleeds, it leads. You gotta, you gotta hook him, you gotta hook him early. He invented the headline. You know, act one, opening on. <laughs> Anyway, so now there's one last guild, the Guild of Farriers, I like. I'm gonna write that down for now. It's not, we're not done. But they don't, they don't, um... so that's really good. The Guild of Farriers is important because uh, transportation, if you control transport, if you're the, if you're the guild, uh, but transport in the city, we mean, obviously, like, uh, I forgot, I, I failed to learn how to spell couriers. But the reason the guild of farriers is important is because um, everybody who needs to, they're, they're, obviously you can just walk somewhere. Um, you might take a coach, which is really expensive and they're not that fast. Um, but a very common way for, I would say, like if you in the real world can afford, um, I'm trying to think like, you know, if you can afford a, a, a Tesla, uh, the new one, the new cheap, the new quote unquote cheap one, you can afford a flying carpet. You can afford, it's probably a, there's probably a fee and it's flying carpets all over the place. You don't, but you don't own them. You don't own them. So that's one of the ways that the people get around and you see this all over the place is that um, for a fee, you get a license, not a license, you get like a pass or something. And that's that's how they make their money. Is they control they control the kind of flying carpet network. That's what this is. Is you you if you can afford it, and some middle class, all most upper middle class, all upper class people can afford one of these uh, medallions that lets them use the um, the uh, the farriers and couriers, but also just being a courier and you know transport of information and stuff like that. Um, there is a guild for actors and playwrights. There is the Leaf. But it's not clear to me that those guys are one of the important ones. I think they're important. I think the leaf is important because everybody goes to the theater. And the, and as a result, if your play is popular, you affect thought. Does that make sense? So there's tons of guilds, but we're only worried about the three who are actually on the list of the Lords of Capital. So we know that one of them is the, uh, we know that one of them is the Broadsheet Guild, uh, one of them is the Fulcrum. Uh, let me make sure I'm using this word right. Yeah, they're the Assayers Guild. They determine the prices of things. That's where they get their power from. They're kind of like the Fed, if that makes any sense, if you're not an American. Even if you are American, that might be an obscure thing. Yeah, I think it's the Guild of Farriers and Couriers. I think they're the next guys. Uh, these guys are called the Rasp. The Broadsheet Guild is run by a woman. Uh, the Docks are, the, the Assayers, the Fulcrum is one run by a woman. I think this guild is not gonna be run by a woman because that would be a little bit too on the nose, if you know what I mean. They're called the rasp because uh, a rasp is a tool that farriers use to shave off the, ho the hooves of horses. And these guys run all of the, all of the, uh, not all of, 
but a lot of the horses. Like, uh, even though, so they're named the Rasp because they predate, that name predates a time when there were flying carpets. But they still run all of the, the couriers use horses, the, uh, a lot of the coaches use horses, all the coaches use horses. Horses for courses. Where do all the carpets come from? That's a good question. I think these guys sort of have a monopoly. They don't really have public transport. Is there another ner is there another name for gondola? Skiff, cog. Those are all good answers. So who who run who's in charge of the rasp? A gith. A gith. That's not bad. Um, a rat man? Um, a raiden white? A half thing? I think a djinn is too powerful a creature for this. It has to be something that could reasonably be like a player character. I don't know why people's, n none of these suggestions are really causing me to go, oh, and then what that means is that I don't know, I don't know enough about this person. A dwagar. Who is this person that runs the guild of farriers and couriers? This is somebody, they have a, what do we know about them? Very little. We know that if uh, you get on a boat, if you take a coach, if you need to get a letter across the city very quickly, uh, get information from one point to another very quickly, you use these folks. And they're a seal on something. They're kind of like um, the, like Dr. Yui, like that, like it's, if they're, they're incorruptible. Um, you don't trust you don't trust messages delivered by anybody else because they can be forged. Uh, actually, a high elf is not a bad idea. A mind flare. I think that's too weird. This is one of those things that's going to be very personal. It's going to be very personal. I have my own idea about no, that's too weird. That's too boring. It needs to be. But um, is it a ganasi? Is a half jinn a ganasi? Yeah? Okay, then I think it's gotta be a Ganassi. Is it a fire Ganassi? So some of you folks, um, this is going to be make more sense to than others, um, but Sirtan, I agree, I agree with this. But um, Alloy is my version of the City of Brass. It's also called the City of Brass, but Alloy is the proper name of it. it is the capital city of the plane of the quintessence, the plane of all elements, the plane of four elements, um, and so that's where these that's where these carpets come from. They don't they don't. The technology to make them, or the magic to make them, may not exist in the mundane world. So this dude is is he's from Alloy, and he runs. And so he, but but that was a while ago. This is a. He's probably like old. I mean, like, like you know, he, his his species doesn't age the way humans do. Um, Uh, stand by. Okay. So, uh, the rasp. 
are the Guild of Farriers and Couriers. They have a monopoly on flying carpets. Um, so, you know, like, um, they're also UPS. Um, uh, So now you understand how, why they have all this power. They have a lot of power. And so what's a good name for a fire Ganassi? I literally know nothing about them other than what you have told me in this chat. I might change that monkey with it a little bit. In my experience, most campaigns die on the vine. Just because I have a cool idea for a game and have done a lot of prep work for it, doesn't mean we get more than a month into it. After a month, people might be like, this isn't, I'm not having a fun time. This isn't the way I wanted this to go. This isn't, you know, I've had most of my campaigns, every campaign I've run that lasted, and I think I've run basically three campaigns that last, where we played every week for three years. Um, for every one of those, there was probably nine games we started and just petered out and started and just petered out and didn't go anywhere and didn't turn into what we thought it was going to do, you know. It's like a band writing a song. Not every not every time you get together the jam does it turn into Cashmere. Actually, Cashmere is a good name. Actually, Cashmere is a good name. Sorry, I think I might be about to. I think I might be about to change this. I think Cashmere is a cool name. I know it's a real word from the real word. I don't mind. So, Lord Cashmere, he's a fire. Can picture this guy, really flamboyant character. Um, but I don't really know a lot about him. So this dude believes in the idea of nobility and thinks, because he's from the place where that's pretty common. And uh, and so he's like, yeah, 100% I want to buy in, right? I want a seat at the table, but I don't just want a seat at the table. He's the one where you go to his place, it looks like a palace. He spends the money to, to impress you and make you think, you would think this guy was a nobleman even if you knew nothing about what was going on in the capital. And he likes it that way. And the idea that someone whose head is on fire is a nobleman in capital, an alien, a literal alien, just disgusts the nobility. Right? This surely will upset the nobility. Yeah. Um, you know, he might even affect a Rio and mustache. You know, hang on a second, I have to put on my fake mustache. <laughs> Right, because he loves that. Um, right, he, this is his adopted city, and he's crazy in love with it. Huge patron of the arts. Um, so, it's very difficult for people for, uh, He's a Riojophile, 100%. He's got Rio and art all over the place. Um, yeah, he, lo he he's a huge patron of the arts. He goes to the theater all the time. Uh, when, when this guy dies, he will be assassinated at the theater. Um, yeah, I think... Um,
so he's kind of changed the, the his technology has changed the structure of the city and what it can do and how quickly information can be transmitted back and forth and how quickly people can get back and forth and if 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 you know if these carpets stopped working or if he took them away you wouldn't have one city anymore the city is too large you'd have seven cities you have seven distinct cities and they'd be unable to get their stuff done anyway so i feel like we're almost done well i think the rasp is well, the rasp is way older than this guy the rasp the rasp is the, the rasp existed back when there were just horses i don't think it'll be i don't think it'll be a lot this people in capital don't know how to make them uh the people the people of capital do not know how to make flying carpets uh, probably no one on this planet does uh the magic of apart from like wish um so they're uh you know the, they they've got to rely on this guy uh where he's from flying carpets are somewhat unremarkable but he's from another universe <laughs> so you know we could definitely uh have a, a subplot where someone else comes up with flying carpet tech right and suddenly the whole balance of the city is thrown into disarray and that's drama. Uh, no, I don't think Kashmir. Kashmir. It's been like 150 years since that dude was. Uh, he might. He might um, be familiar with the chain just because it depends on whether or not he has to go to Alloy to get his supply, or whether or not his supplier comes to him. And I'm not sure about that. Um, so, folks, we're done. We know who the lords of capital are. Duke Prospero. Uh, she's not a duke. I don't know what the, these people are. All, all the guild members. All these guild masters. All these, these three, I should say, are all nobles. I just don't know what their, what their title is. They're not dukes. Uh, Shirome runs the fulcrum and controls um, the, uh, the exchange. Uh, Duke Orsino, that lord of House Navarre, is the head of the Church of St. Isabella the Pedalus. Duke Marco, lord of House Verona. It's grown on me. Lord of the Admiralty. The dead lady doesn't really belong to any, any of these factions. Um, and is the reason, right now, is the reason that the nobles don't just run roughshod and just constantly outvote the guilds. Um, the whole idea of having to vote to get things done disgusts the, the nobles, but the prince is dead. Um, the Broadsheet Guild, run by Inan al Adwina, Adwia, Adwia, yeah, Inan al Adwia. It'll take me a while to get that, but I'll get there. Uh, and her partner, her uh, kind of partner in crime, Alisar, the editor of the paper. Keep in mind, there's probably several different broadsheets, right? But all of them pay a tithe. They all use her press or her presses, her technology. Uh, so three hours and 27 minutes. It's, not, it's a pretty good stream. And then the RASP, uh, the guild of farriers and couriers who have a monopoly on flying carpets. They run most of the transport in the city. So I feel like uh, we've done a pretty good job. Uh, I don't know what the next stream is going to be. We could certainly do deep dives on each of these. Uh, we could talk about who the other powerful characters in the city are. Um, it's funny that a lot of people are like, oh, the dead lady is super cool. But now we'll see what... It, it, eventually we'll know more about Duke Prospero and Orsino and um, Marco. And there will be reasons to like those guys. Like I said, it won't be all uh, black and white. It would be nice to know what these dots are. What the names of the districts are. Stuff like that. So, I don't know. And we may, uh, we may stream next Saturday. I'm taking... This is supposed to be the beginning of my vacation. Everybody else is off. Uh, like milk. <laughs> no, uh, everybody else is off on vacation. And I'm supposed to take two weeks off. But I'm probably going to be spending a lot of that two weeks. Like, what does vacation mean to me? It just means I don't come in here. So I'll probably be doing a lot of patching and tweaking, a lot of modular synthesis, maybe some writing, but we'll probably still do streaming and maybe make some videos. In fact, I might make a, I might make a YouTube video today. Uh, Jerry showed me how to set everything up. Uh, Net hack before the end of the year, maybe I don't know. That kind of is when the we still man we still we had a hell of an awesome Net hack run that we're kind of hopefully in the middle of because our Net hack character just now has a bone devil pet and is a master mind flare. So things are going well. No family to visit? Nope. Uh, so yeah, NetHack soon, I think, but I don't know when. Uh, hopefully you guys 
hopefully everybody feels like we've made good progress. Really all we needed to do today was figure this stuff out. Sorry, excuse me. Was figure this stuff out and we did. It took way, way longer than it would if I were just sitting here on my own. But I think also we got a lot of really cool stuff figured out that we might not have if it were just me sitting here. We wouldn't, th definitely if it were me sitting here, we, these things would not have this structure. But having you folks in chat helps come up with really cool, really cool ideas. So, um, you know, we might get together and play code names on our normal code names night. I don't know about that. That's up to, that depends on how many people are around. Um, so, I've uh, seen my mouse in two places. It's confusing me. All right, so I think that's it. I think we're going to stop. Uh, and I don't know when the next time we're going to get together is. Maybe next Saturday. Maybe Tuesday night for code names. Maybe a, a NetHack stream. Um, I don't know. Follow me on Twitter. I know people hate. I know a lot of people hate Twitter. I love Twitter. Um, but my my Twitter experience is probably different than most people's. It's mostly um, it's mostly biologists and feminism. Uh, so I love Twitter. Twitter is great. Uh, so follow me on Twitter. That's where you get the updates regarding when the next stream is going to be. If we ever get more organized, we'll use our Twitch our Twitch technology better to communicate with people. But uh, until then, be seeing you.